Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sankofa Video Books and Cafe. My name is Kamal Grimes. I'm going to be your host tonight, and we have the pleasure of being joined by Angelique Nelson, who is the author of this wonderful book here that in my hand called For the Culture, a Genealogy Handbook of the Cool Kids. And we're just going to get started. I'm going to read a description of Angelique and allow her to add anything that she wants to add. Um, as well when I finished. So Angelique Nelson is an accomplished speaker, educator, and historian with a passion for genealogy. She wrote this book to fill a void in the available literature about genealogy for black kids. She lives in Washington, D.C., where she founded the nonprofit Majani Project, www.majani.org, a free genealogy club to introduce youth to family history and genetic genealogy. So please uh, join me in welcoming Angelique Nelson to Sankofa. So my first question would be, um, can you add to that brief biography and, and let the people know uh, who are watching and hear a little bit more about your background and what led you to writing this book? Sure, thank you, Kamal. Um, first, I would like to say thank you to Sankofa Bookstore for hosting me in this event. Um, Sankofa Bookstore is such a historic place in D.C., and so I'm really honored to be here tonight, so thank you. Um, a little bit more about me is, uh, I think like a lot of people in the pandemic, um, I had time to really think about what I wanted to do in terms of the legacy that I wanted to leave, you know, before I leave this planet. And genealogy has always been something that's been really important to me. And so I just remember thinking one day, wow, I wish I'd, I wish I'd started studying it younger, like as a younger person, as opposed to an older adult. And then it just occurred to me, well, it's a little late for you, but maybe you could make that happen for some other younger people. And so that's how the whole idea of the Majani Project was born. And then in the service of creating a nonprofit, um, I was looking around online and in different bookstores trying to find a book that specifically spoke to black kids because my, my focus, I really wanted it to introduce genealogy to, to young black people. And I couldn't find anything that specifically targeted black youth. And so I thought, well, gosh, I guess I'll just write it myself. And that's that's how the book came about. And um, that's that's a little bit, that's a very brief version. So I mean, I could talk forever about that particular story. But yeah, that's kind of how the book was born and the nonprofit. So I want to start off with the basics. Let's start off with the title. How did you come up with the title for the culture, a genealogy handbook for the cool kids? And who are the cool kids? <laughs> <laughs> this is really inclusive. So if you decide that you're a cool kid, you are a cool kid. Um, but as far as uh, how I came up with the title, um, those of you, or maybe I should say us, who are or have been in academia, some things just never change, and so you sort of get used to reading books with really long titles. <laughs> and so um, when I started writing this book, I, I didn't start out thinking, okay, I'm going to have a really long title just because. But in, this, in the process of writing it, one of the things that always comes up in black culture especially is that we do things for the culture. That is sort of a standby phrase that we all hear and we all know, but it's for the culture. And so I knew that that was going to be part of the title. And then I'm not exactly sure how the rest of it came to me, but it did. And so it just sort of, the handbook part is because there are activities in the book. It's not just like a textbook. There are actual activities for kids. And so I wanted it to reflect that in the title that there's, you know, that it's an activity book as well. So what age group is this book intended for? And can it be useful to adults as well? So the age group for this book is 13 and up or 12 and up, you know, if the, if the youth is pretty mature. And the reason for that, the reason that it's not a kid's genealogy book like, you know, 7 to 12 is because when we start researching our history, our family history, a lot of times there's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, the reality is that most of us have a background where our family or ancestors were enslaved. And so I didn't want to create a book that, you know, you don't want it to be something where younger people, where they're too young to really understand or appreciate that. And so that's why a lot of this, not a lot, but there are things in the book that I think are more appropriate for older children as opposed to young kids. And so 13 just seemed like an appropriate age. And of course, it's absolutely for adults. 
Um, the adults are the cool kids. <laughs> So, but yeah, it's a it's a book for thirteen and up. So even though you know it's I, I wrote it for younger people, it's it's for all age groups. So I wanted to get a little bit into the structure of the book and your your uh, mindset and methodology in terms of how you structured the book. So it is a handbook, as you mentioned. So uh, I see you have a lot of different um, chapters, maybe twenty chapters or so. How did you come up with the organization of the book, and um, how how can people use this book practically? So I didn't start out as in most things. You start something, and then it just sort of takes on a life of its own. And so, as I was writing the book, my my background is as a historian. That's what my degrees are in. And so I don't think that you can really talk about family history or genealogy without talking about some of the history first. And so I wanted to start with the history. And so in starting with the history, then I decided, well, I want to start with Africa because that's where we're from, right? Originally, that's where we're from. And so the fact that we learn so little about the continent and about individual countries in, of Africa, that made me that much more determined to include that in the book. So the very first chapter is about Africa. And, you know, I didn't set out to write a history book so because it could have been like five times longer than it is. But I just wanted to at least give people an introduction to Africa and just the, the second chapter, the second and third chapters, it sort of goes from Africa and then into Central America and South America. And if you're wondering why I did that, it's also because I didn't realize until I was probably maybe in my 30s that there was such a large African diaspora. Because in school, you're not taught that there are black people in South America. You're not taught that there are black people in Central America, unless you're from you know, maybe the Caribbean, then you know that. But if you're like me and I was born in Los Angeles, I didn't know that until I went to grad school. And so I, I think that there, there is such a disconnect in how the education system teaches African history and just Pan-African history in general. And so I wanted to have that be part of the book. So, so it kind of went from there. So that's kind of how it started. And then it goes into a little bit of African-American history, because again, you can't really talk about family history without talking about a little bit of back of the background, and so that's kind of how that came out. And then um, I sort of I go into actual genealogy techniques and tips and just how to get started. This is an introductory book, so it's it's not super deep, even though it might look like it. There's the reason that it looks like there's so many pages is because there's a lot of pictures, <laughs> so it's not it's not all text, okay. Um, but I do want to mention, too, that one of the things that I was most proud of is in talking about the Pan-African um, diaspora, I also included charts of just how the percentages of numbers of black people in every single country in, in uh, South America, Central America, and also the provinces in Canada, because we just, we don't learn about that, and we certainly don't think about it. Yeah, I love that about your book. Actually, that's one of the favorite, first things I saw. Um, when I opened up the book, when you brought it for review, was that you had uh, every African country and flag, the flags, um, the, the national languages, and also you did the same thing for Central America, South America, the Caribbean islands, and Canada, the different regions. So I thought that was an excellent way to, to open up the book and, and give, give us a broad scope and understanding of this genealogy because when you think about it, um, there you know, I've heard people say, I don't want to uh, misquote, but we shouldn't focus so much on where we shouldn't get too caught up on where the, the, the slave boat you know dropped us off, the slave ship dropped us off because they all they took us from the same place. So some of the same people that they took from Africa, they took some to Brazil and then they took some to the United States, some to Jamaica and or Colombia, all these different places. And you know, you could have family and likely do have family and relatives in all these different countries. And so, you know, I definitely uh, echo the sentiment of, you know, it's almost like the blackout of uh, the black diaspora. And for some reason in this country, where it's almost like we think, okay, there's black people in Africa, the Caribbean and United States. And we somehow think that's it, not even knowing that there's more people of African descent in Brazil. And that I found this out. It was only about 10% of the, the enslaved were actually brought to the United States. The mass majority were brought to South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. 
So it's kind of interesting how we have an overblown sense of our ourselves in terms of our you know population, and we're just you know totally ignorant. So I'm very happy that you did that. I thought that was excellent. And I'm a teacher, a social studies teacher as well. So it's like seeing all the maps and seeing all of the flags, it was really exciting for me. So that leads me to my next question. And you mentioned that you kind of alluded that it's not all text. So if you do flip through this book, you're going to notice that there's a lot of pictures, charts, graphs, um, blurbs on the side. It's very colorful and it's a very engaging book. So what was the rationale behind, you know, including so much text? Uh, including so many pictures and images and you know what was the rationale behind that and how do you think that uh, enhances the book can i just go back to something that you said before about the way that african and african history is taught in this country one of the reasons for that i mean if you if you think about what you learned in school when it comes to history right like, and even just what you see in the media, when you see pictures of, you know, vacations in Brazil or the Caribbean, it's usually white people. And so, of course, so it's, it's it, to me, it goes back to that, the, the systemic racism in so many areas. I mean, you can literally pick one, whether it's real estate or, tax, or the tax laws, any area of this country, you see the effects of racism. And to me, and that was a huge one to me, is when you see on TV and you never saw black people in any of those countries that they were promoting. And so it makes you think there's no black people there. So I just kind of wanted to say that to, to let you know, like the further rationale behind including that. Now, as far as the pictures go, I understand that I'm a reader, so I like words, but I do understand that most people like to see visuals. Like that's how a lot of people learn is through visuals. And so I, it was important to me to include that because not everybody wants to read a bunch of text. They want to see, you know, the visual about it. So that was the reason for including the graphs and the pictures and just sort of breaking it up into blurbs and just not having like, you know, pages upon pages. Now in the back, when you get to the very end, there are a lot of, I included like a lot of resources in terms of family history, like different free websites that you can go to. And so in those pages, there's maybe not quite as many pictures, but that's, that's when you get to the end. So if you make it to there, then you're good. <laughs> I just open up to a page and and I'm very excited about this chart because this is something that I've used with my students in teaching the history of the transatlantic slave trade. You have, uh, a, we have a map that shows the numbers, the official numbers. We know the numbers are way bigger than this, actually. But the official numbers of, uh, and, and locales of where the, slave, the enslaved Africans were taken from and where they were dropped off. So I want to just hold up this map. Um, and you can get, you can access some of these, these resources online, but I want to, it was, it's just very interesting. So I'm not going to read all of it, but you see Senegambia, 603,140 were taken, Sierra Leone, 246,155. Um, and even Southeast, this is one that a lot of people don't know, Southeast Africa, uh, primarily Mozambique, uh, 408,087. So, we learned, um, and then where they were dropped off, you can see Dutch Guyana, 294,000, uh, Amazonia, 18,000, Europe, 9,000, um, Carolina, Georgia, 210,000, and so many different regions. Uh, you're learning different terms like the Bight of Benin, Bight of Biafra, and all of these terms, it's, it's really exciting um, to see it all uh, in a, a visual. So um, I just wanted to point that out. These are some of the type of things that you're going to get when you're looking at the book. Not only that, but you have uh, pictures from the Gullah Geechee in South, uh, I mean, in South Carolina. Um, you just have all these different graphs. It, it's really fun book. I think uh, I, I can't imagine this book being used in school. The way you design this book is very good for educational purposes. I would definitely say. So I highly recommend it. Um, I just kind of got a little bit excited about the book, <laughs> just looking through it in the moment. It was just like, wow, this is, uh, it, it's so packed, jam packed. Um, now, how does one, now you mentioned the resources. I wanted to get into that. What are some of the resources that you included for folks who are interested in learning their genealogy, more about their genealogy? Um, and then a follow up question to that would be, have you, well, I'm, I'm assuming that you have done it for yourself, and how is your own process 
and how I'm sure it's probably still ongoing. How is your process? How has that been for you? And how is it now? So first, uh, yeah, first. So some of the resources that I listed, and I, I really wanted, there's there's a lot of things that you can pay for online in terms of genealogy, but there's also a lot of free stuff. And so it was important to me, especially when we're talking about introducing genealogy to black kids, that they know and understand what's available in terms of the free resources. So I started there. And so the first um, list is African-American genealogical sources that you can you know type in the website, look up whatever it is you want. Um, they include things like, um, passenger ship list, um, free census data. So all the things that are free, that are freely available, you can find that. Um, and then I go from there into like a general genealogy um, websites. I can't think of any right off the top of my head at the moment, but they're all in there. <laughs> so you can, you can buy it and see it. And then I go into, I talk about DNA testing. Um, I don't know if that was going to be one of your questions, but I'll, I'll use it as a segue into the yeah. second part of the, what you asked me. Um, I know that when it comes to DNA tests, it's kind of, um, there's a lot of different feelings about there out there about DNA, but I will say this, I, I went to a genomics lecture and I heard um, uh, a professor from Howard, Dr. Fatima Jackson, she talked about how the fact that the representative sample of DNA for black people is so limited. And so when you talk about trying to use those, those DNA samples to study for genetic diseases that are endemic to our population, it's almost impossible because the samples are so tiny. And so if for nothing else, I would encourage everyone to do a DNA do a DNA test just so that the scientists have the sample so that they can study it. And then for our ancestry, I mean, you, you can't, they, the science behind DNA ancestry is always evolving. And so if you've ever done a DNA test and you know you get that email that says, hey, they shifted or something, you know, something's different now. So then you go and look it up and you know, it, it might, whereas before it was, you know, 24% Malian and 34% and Nigerian, and then it shifts to 17%, and you're like, what, what's happening? Well, it's because as the science gets better and as more people take the test, they can sort of pinpoint better like where your what your actual percentages are. So I believe in DNA tests. I will say that proudly. I've taken several. Um, they're kind of all the same, so you don't have to be like me and take you know as many as you possibly can. <laughs> But um, there is one that's a little bit different, the African Ancestry. It was the last one I took because it was the most expensive. Um, if you were here last night and you heard um, Victoria talk about that. Um, and it's, it's a good test. What I liked about it is that it does, it, it only specifically looks at your African Ancestry. So it's not going to, whereas Ancestry.com or 23andMe are going to look at all of your DNA, whether it's European, African, whatever. African ancestry only looks at, at the black DNA. So it can it, it pinpoints what tribe you could possibly be from. Again, you know, tribes migrated all across Africa, so it's you can't it can't necessarily tell you that you're from Senegal, but it could tell you like what tribe that you're possibly from. So the, they told it came back, oh, and it checks your 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 mitochondria, which is um, your mother's DNA. Right, and so mine came back saying that my mother's family, the ancestry came from the Fulani tribe. So um, I've been trying to learn a little bit more about the Fulani. But um, in terms, no, I forgot your question. <laughs> um, it was, you're actually answering, it was your, you, you answered the resources and then your process. So you're actually answering it now. Okay, okay, yeah, my process. Um, I'm still working on it, it's definitely a work in progress. Uh, because I've been busy with the nonprofit and then the book, I've kind of put my own research by the side, but I'm going to pick it back up again this year because my goal is to become certified, to become a professional certified genealogist. It's for me, it's a big deal because there are so few black certified professional genealogists. It's and, and that's not to say that that people who are not certified are not just as great as the ones who are, but it's it's representation is important, and I think it's important for younger black kids to see professional. Certificate certified genealogist. So that, that's my goal this year, which means I got to pick back up my my actual my family study and, and get that portfolio done. That's exciting. Um, I took the African ancestry DNA test as well, and I actually also was Fulani. And the interesting thing is that uh, I I I knew a girl uh, when I was in college, and she was Sierra Leonean, and she told me that I was Fulani. Yeah, before. So then I took the test because it just, she knew based on how I looked that I was Fulani. And now the more I study the Fulani and their history and, and culture, 
I already knew you were going to say that you were full. <laughs> you look like the people in my family. <laughs> um, so that, that's exciting as well. Um, yeah, we got to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll talk, you know. Um, and yesterday, uh, we did have an event. You mentioned the event yesterday. So for those who weren't here, you guys could go on YouTube and see uh, all of our events that we do here. We stream them, or all the ones that have been streamed and uploaded. Um, so we do it live, like this is live right now. Hey, everybody. Um, <laughs> sorry, we don't have anyone checking. <laughs> so we, like, yesterday, we had someone checking the chat, but I don't think there's... Oh, you are? Okay, we do have someone uh, checking the chat. So if you have any questions, we are going to get uh, time for question and answer. I have maybe two or three more questions, and then we're just going to open it up for the floor. So I know you guys have questions as well. Um, but yesterday, there was an event about a book uh, called Akata, um, and there's a subtitle to that as well. But it was about this one sister. It was a memoir of her own personal journey in, into ancestry and genealogy. Um, it was very exciting. And at the end, she raffled off two uh, kits, two DNA kits. And I actually won one of the kits. So it was 23 in me, um, which is interesting because I, uh, I kind of did the opposite of you. Uh, I waited for them, the African ancestry, to have a sale. <laughs> uh, it's still more expensive than the other ones, but what it does is it, it, it connects you to a culture. Because when you, when you do these other tests, which I'm going to do eventually, well, now that I got the free one, I'm going to definitely do it. But when you do these other tests, it's like they give you a pie chart of you're 50% this and 30% that, and then two years later they'd say, oh no, you're 30% that and 50% this, um, which, is, which is cool. But um, it goes into what you were saying about the samples and, and also a trust. Um, a lot of black people don't trust these companies. A lot of people in general don't really trust the companies, but especially black people, you know, for, for the reasons we understand why. Um, however, African ancestry, uh, to me, they appear more trustworthy because one, they're black owned. Two, uh, they also said expressly that they're not going to sell your DNA information. They actually have, and this is actually one of the things that is going on now is that the, the other companies have been approaching African ancestry to give them their samples so that they can have this, the samples, the large amount of samples that um, to do the research on health or, or just charting um, you know, the human genome, but they're not giving them the samples. So it, it, because they wanted to protect the confidentiality and the promise that they made to their people. So it, it, it'll be kind of interesting how things go because it's like African ancestry, they have like a lot of African samples, but the major company, oh, the, I say the major companies like that, the, the ones that you guys have heard of, because African Ancestry actually was founded before Ancestry.com. It's kind of interesting. People thought, you know, it was an offshoot. No, it actually was founded like before. Um, so they have the samples of Africa, but the other companies, they have the samples from everywhere else. So it's like a give and take you know, and doing the test. So I just wanted to, at least, I just wanted to mention that part about the different aspects. So you mentioned, and I want to get into to something as you said in the beginning, you had a quote in the beginning of your book that said, black history is family history. So this, given the fact that this is Black History Month, what is the role, what do you, what do you see the role of ancestry and genealogy, family history, within the, the broader topic of black history? I don't think that you can have any kind of history without family history. That's where it all starts. And that's where that quote, I, I kind of made, came up with that myself, is that black history is family history, um, especially for, for black Americans and you know other Pan-Africans. The way that the education system has sort of denied our history for so many years, it's its criminal, for one thing. That's a whole other tangent I could go off on, but for, for, for the purposes of this discussion, um, you there's, there's research already that lots of research has shown that you cannot, as an individual, without knowing your family history, it impacts who you become. It impacts your self-identity. It impacts your idea of yourself and your own resilience. And so the fact that our history is so often not taught in schools 
I mean, even up, unless you, when you get to grad school, only if you take African American history classes, right? And a lot of people don't because they don't think we have a history. And so, in, and it not, it not only impacts black people, it, impla it impacts all Americans because other Americans think we don't have a history. And so we, we see ourselves as less than. And I know for myself, I wasn't necessarily bullied in school, but I had the exact opposite experience where I was invisible in school. I never had, I, I went to white schools and I went to a white church and my dad was in the army, so we moved around. So I, I didn't live near extended family that could give me that sort of positive affirmation that you get from your cousins and grand, you know, grandma and auntie. I didn't have any of that. And so going to schools where you're sort of ignored and just not there, it, it has an effect. And so that was really a lot of the motivation too behind writing this book is because even though people may not have my particular story, they have a similar story. Like the, the girl yesterday, Vicky. If you guys, if you get a chance, you really need to listen to her interview. It was so impactful. She talked about her own issues with, with, with hating herself because she was a dark-skinned black girl and just the bullying that she received from that. And so all these stories, you know, we all have these stories that impact us and, and make us become who we are. And so understanding that our history started with family and not with slavery is, is critical because we all, you know, who wants to be told that, oh, you didn't even have a history until you got to this country or your people got to this country as a slave. And it's not even true, but they told us that because for their own purposes, right? And so just kind of trying to sort of come full circle and not only disrupt the whole school to prison pipeline by sort of impacting kids to understand that they do have a history and that they do have resilience. So yeah, I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> I don't even remember the question, <laughs> but I'm sure you answered it. Um, now, my follow-up question is, I, uh, chapter 18 is about family interviews. So I want to read a little bit from chapter 18, and I think this will be my, uh, I have one more question, then we're going to open it up. So I want to read a bit from chapter 18, where it says, go after those family interviews. Interviewing your immediate and extended family members is very important to the black genealogist. You'll be amazed at what you can learn from older members of your family. It won't always be, it won't always be rainbows and sunshine, but even hearing about the bad, the hard stuff can be rewarding because it will give you a better understanding of your heritage, as well as the challenges and accomplishments of different relatives. The memories you gather can be collected not just uh, for yourself, but for future generations of your family. And I'll just read a couple of steps that she had here. Um, one, make a list of make a list of people you want to interview. How are you related to them? Will this be a group interview or an individual interview? There are pros and cons to each method. In group interviews, it's possible that what one person says will jog the memory of someone else and you, go, you get fuller, richer stories. And in an individual interview, you can ask targeted questions that really get at the core of who that person is. Three, will you meet in person or on the phone or via another online video platform, i.e. FaceTime, Skype, Facebook, Microsoft Teams, Zoom. <laughs> you didn't have Zoom in there. The world, during the pandemic, like the world like, went on Zoom. At least my world did. Um, and number uh, number four, and I'll read number five too. Think through what it is you really want to learn about. And if you aren't really sure, that's okay. Think of your interviews as fact gathering missions. And five, ask around and see if one of your older relatives has created a family tree or, got, or collected genealogical information for your family. That way you can just continue the work that has already been started. So I, I want to know a bit about your experience in doing family interviews, if there's anything that you could share with us, um, any interesting things you found out, and maybe that you were willing to share with us. I'm willing to share it all. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, we don't have that kind of time. And then secondly, uh, some of my family might be on the online, so I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, they, I don't know if they want me to tell all the stories I've come across. But anyway, um, so, in terms of doing the interviews, excuse me. In terms of doing the interviews, um, 
it's important that you that you just start. A lot of time, like our culture is an oral culture, right? We, for most of us, we've heard the some well, not most of us. Some of us have heard the family stories. Start writing down what you remember, and then you can start sort of filling in the blanks. Like talk to your parents, talk to your siblings, because people, everybody remembers things differently. So I, you know, you and I could go to the same birthday party, and we have a totally different memory of what happened, right? So talk to people in your family about different family events, whether they, you know, maybe it was a, a wedding or whatever, a christening, something like that. So you can sort of start just recording those histories. Um, you, you, if you go in with a list, that's always a good idea because then you can sort of stay on track. <laughs> but um, in terms of my own family, um, what is, I found out some, let me put it this way. I talked earlier about, you know, some of the times that it's not going to be always rainbows and sunshine, right? And in my family, that was definitely the case. Um, I found out things that were hard. Um, one story that my mom told me, and hopefully they don't mind me telling this story, but one of the things she told me was that um, my grandfather just sort of, let's let me put it this way, I'll set it up for you. So my grandma's at home, you know, with, you know, the kids or whatever, and there's a knock on the door, and a man, a man, she opens the door, there's a man there, and he's like, who are you? And she's like, who are you? <laughs> and so he's like, well, this is my house. And she's like, no, this is my house. My husband, her husband had sold the house out from under her. And so she had like 24 hours to pack up everything she owned and get out. So when you hear stories like that in your own family, you're like, how could someone who's related to me be that cruel to somebody that they're supposed to love, right? And so these are the kinds of, you know, it's, it's sort of funny now, but it, I'm sure it wasn't funny then, right? And it was really traumatic. And so you think about the stories that you find out in your family are not always going to be the heroic stories that we wish they were. They might be traumatic. They might be worse than that. And that's bad, but there are stuff, things that happen that are worse. And so you have to be prepared to deal with those kinds of things. And not only deal with them, but be prepared, be okay with talking about them and sharing them. A lot of the times we don't talk about our history because it is painful because it is really terrible, right? And our elders don't talk about it because it was even worse for them. They don't wanna remember that stuff because it was terrible. And so you have to go in understanding that and be compassionate. And if somebody doesn't wanna to talk to you, don't force it. You know, that's, what, that's the great thing about having other extended family. Maybe someone else in that family is willing to talk about these things. But the trauma is real. There's a whole, there's a whole field of study about epigenetics, which is the study of collective trauma. And it's, it's a real thing. I mean, trauma is passed down through generations. And so as black people, we have to understand that. But I think now is the time to start maybe dealing with it because as our elders are passing away, all of those stories are, start going, are going to start being lost and they're not going to be able to be recovered. My grandmother passed before I really got into genealogy. My father passed. And so I don't even really know like most of the people on my father's side of the family, which is just sad. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to sort of you know, make up for lost time now but if I start this journey younger, then maybe I'd, I'd have that information now. So in terms of just, it just start where you are, even if a lot of people in your family have passed away, just start where you are, start with who's living and who, you know, they may remember things about the people that have passed away. Um, to end on a funnier note, it's, it's really just as sad, but just, it's not quite so personal. Turns out that one of my ancestors had a family in both Los Angeles and San Diego. <laughs> so, so there's a whole bunch of people in San Diego that I guess I'll catch up with one of these days. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that story. Um, the last question I'll ask before we open it up to the floor, those online and in the physical space is, um, you have a chapter 15, uh, which part of the title speaks of reparative genealogy. And when I saw that, that, in, that interested me a lot. Can you explain a little bit more of the concept of reparative genealogy and how it's important to this whole study? Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because it's an important concept and it's a relatively new one. But um, the way that I define it, and, and I won't say that mine is like the definition, but the way that I understand it is reparative genealogy is the idea that as you do your family research and you share it with your family members, that it just starts to sort of build up things that maybe people didn't even know were broken down. It just it fills in those holes and those gaps just in yourself that you may not even realize. The flip side of that, too, is that it actually is reparative genealogy is also for white people because we 
because of our shared history, we need white people to do their genealogy and put those records online so that we can find them and complete our own research. There are so many families, black and white, that are so intertwined, but because records don't really exist that much for black people, we need white people to do their genealogy and not be afraid to put whatever they find online, the good and the bad, you know, the slave schedules, the whatever it is that you've got, we need you to, to be brave and put that online because it goes towards healing and it goes towards reconciliation. When I can go online and find, you know, let's just say, I'll, you know, I find out, Meredith, if you don't mind me using you as an example. <laughs> if I just, if I find out that, you know, I, I reach out to her because we took a DNA test and we somehow match on some segment of our DNA and I reach out to her and I say, well, Meredith, do you have any records? And if she's gracious enough to put those, avail make those available to me, that's healing, that's reconciliation. So it goes both ways. Definitely, definitely. I, I love that, I love that. Now I wanna take this opportunity to open the floor for any questions, comments. Do we have anyone here with any questions? You don't, you don't have to speak at once. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any comments or any questions online? Okay, well, we, we do have one. We do have one. Uh, yes, brother, please ask your question. Yes. Um, so I know you mentioned this was for ages 13 and up, yeah. the book. Uh, I guess my question would be, what would you want a young person, let's say high school or older, that comes across this book? What What's one thing that you would want them to take away uh, after reading it? I think the most important thing is for them to understand that they do have a history and that they do have a whole group of ancestors behind them that got them to where they are right, this, right now. That's what I would want them to walk away with. And then, of course, I would love for them to actually start doing research into their family history. That would be awesome. Yes, please. I had a very, like, the opposite experience from you when I was in college where everyone was pretty, um, aware of the African diaspora and a lot of people knew where they're, they were from and a majority of the black people there um, were from different countries in Africa and there were very few black Americans there. And there always was this discussion around if we did look into our history and find out where we were from, what would we do with that information in terms of connecting to the culture because it felt like if we knew that we were from this specific area let's say in nigeria when we hang out and are at the nigerian students association would we be accepted because it's not where we are like yes. from but where we are from does that make sense <laughs> yeah. um, i'm glad you brought that up because there, there the discussion last night we, we talked a lot about um just the relationship between africans from the continent which for the purposes of this discussion i'll just call continentals and black Americans and just the disconnect. And I, I know for a fact, I have African friends who have told me um, some of the things that they, that they know other Africans believe about black Americans, um, the conversations that they've had with white people where it's kind of like, you know, everybody thinks black people are lazy or, you know, you name it, the stereotype and they've, they've heard it and repeated it, right? So I, I think when it comes to genealogy, like knowing where you're from, even just like if you if you do an ancestry test or an African ancestry test and you find out the tribe that you're from, that can be a starting point to have conversations with Africans from the continent, right? And it's just it's a place to come together. Like you can say, hey, I found out that my mother's ancestors are from are from the Fulani tribe, and it starts a conversation to where maybe we can start bridging some of those differences and some of those just some of those misconceptions that each group of people have about the other. I know when I was a kid. It was the thing to make fun of Africans. It was the thing to sort of make fun of people who get it. And it comes because of the lack of education that we had about people in Africa, right? So they were different. They were, you know, I'm sure we can all think of things that we heard when we were little. And it's just out of ignorance, out of ignorance. And so I think as, as you learn more about who you are and where you come from, you can use that as a bridge to connect with the continent. And I, I can echo that sentiment as well. Um, we don't need anyone to embrace us, you know. It, 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 we're not looking for anyone's validation to say, yes, you are African. 
No, we are. They don't. No one can tell us yes or no. We make our own decision. We know that our ancestors were taken against their will, and if we choose to stay connected, then that's our choice. If we choose to disconnect, my personal opinion, that's a foolish choice, but it's still our choice. And so there's always been this debate of around Black Americans of, you know, do we embrace our heritage or do we uh, reject it? And there's a lot of ignorance. And there's like a, we, uh, I think that as African Americans, we sometimes uh, very sensitive because of our history. So, and we think that people, we assume that people are not gonna like us. Um, and also I think that we, we judge Africans sometimes we have to realize uh, this, it's very, very hard for people. And I've traveled to five different countries in Africa. So people are like, oh, they're not going to accept us. I mean, honestly, if you don't, if you have a bad attitude, they're not going to accept you. But if you're a knowledgeable, open person, then yes, they will. In fact, a lot of them are waiting for us to come back. But we get a wrong idea uh, because we only interact with probably 0.01% of African population maybe have one or two bad interactions, then we use that to judge uh, an entire continent. And we don't even think that, we don't think about the logic behind that. We're like, oh, well, this one African, uh, one Uber said this, to, you know, we're driving my Uber said this, or like the one person we here said that, and then we make that a whole thing. So definitely we don't want to do that. Don't want to do that at all. Um, yes. Usually genealogy, the direct lines, but some of our families, we got family in that family. And we don't want to just put them to the side because they're not blood. When my mother would talk and she'd say, well, mama, I had to stop and like, which mama are you talking about? The mama who birthed you or the mama who raised you? <laughs> uh, and they both, they lived across the street from each other, uh, <laughs> right? And my grandfather was the one who raised her, who lived with us, but wasn't her father. I don't want to just chuck all them to the side because they are critical to who we are. So, you know, do you have one page where there's direct lines and then you have another page for family, not family? <laughs> can't say that I thought about that that hard, but I will say this, that that's the beauty of family history as opposed to genealogy. Genealogy is like the dates, the facts, the, the actual bones of your family, but family history gives you the space to fill in those blanks with the people who helped raise you, with the people who loved you, who may not have been family. And so that's why I, I, I use those terms genealogy and family history interchangeably, even though like a, you know, in the academic strictest sense of the, you know, they're not the same. But for us, especially as black people who have been raised by so many by the village, right? It's important to, to create space to include those family stories in ours because genealogy, family history, it's, it's about the culture, right? It's about those people who loved you and raised you. And so, yeah, there's absolutely space to put those stories in there too. But you just wanna make sure that you keep track of like who's blood. <laughs> any, any more questions, any comments? Are we getting any engage, uh, anything online, Christina? Oh, um, someone said, what quality control methods are practiced in keeping, keeping one's DNA information confidential? So each DNA company has their own um, set of rules and criteria that they go through. I, I can't say that I'm an expert on, on every single one of those and what those the ethics of, that they practice are. I will say that for the most part, my understanding is that most of them, like 23andMe and Ancestry, they have, if you take their DNA test, they have, when you register like your name to actually get your information back, you have a, cho a choice then to opt in or opt out of different um, parts of their program. So if you don't want your information to be given to another, a third party, then you have the option of making sure that you check the box that says, you know, don't send my information to a third party. We have a couple more questions. Um, she said, sorry if this was covered, but what's the best way to get young people invested or curious about learning about their family and heritage? So I, I don't know that I know what the best way 
because I think this is a good place to start because it's a book specifically for black kids. And it's it's the only one that, that I know of at the moment that's on the market. And I don't want it to be the only one. I hope that more people will write, you know, black, write genealogy book for black kids, write genealogy books for black kids. The more the better. Um, in terms of getting kids interested, though, I think it's it's good if your if your family just starts talking. If you just start having those conversations when you're if you have lunch together or breakfast or dinner, whatever meal that you have or any time that you're together as a family, just start talking about those stories. Uh, kids, kids, even if they don't look like they're listening, they're listening, and so they take that stuff in. And just I think as adults, if we can underscore the importance of of, of those family stories, the kids will pick up on that. Any more questions? I think you said you had a few questions. <coughs> it looks like it's about the same question. But she said, shout out to you, sis. Uh, she's from Georgia. She said, great job. And she said her question is, how would you suggest getting older teens interested in genealogy with all the competition of social media? Mm -hmm. OK, that is from my sister in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> So those are things that I'm, you know, I, I'm a historian. I'm not necessarily, you know, a, a child expert or anything, <laughs> but I would just say there's, there's a lot of competition, obviously, between social media and, you know, kids on their phones. Um, we actually, actually, that is a great segue. Um, we, I do, I, because I understand, you know, that times are different now than they were when I was a kid, because that was a long time ago, but, um, I think that we have to reach them in the in the media that they're that they're using, and one of those media is music. And so, actually, um, I was lucky enough to meet it early on, early last year. I don't even, I can't even tell you how this happened because I'm really not sure anymore. But I was I was online looking for something, and I came across some music, and I was like, "This is the coolest thing I have ever heard." It was a song. It was a hip hop song about the atmosphere and i was like this is so freaking cool like and then it occurred to me like i need a song about genealogy <laughs> and so i was able to catch up with the creator and um we were able to meet and we actually were able to collaborate and put together a song and so we have that song here for you tonight the creator's here mr image right there in the to hear it it's it's not like we're it's he's not me he's still working on it but he was he, he i begged and begged and he said okay i'll play it for you guys tonight so um <laughs> but um so yeah when we finish this i don't have dna test kits but i do have a hip hop song okay. <laughs> i think we can hear them i think we can uh can go along and, and listen to the music right now i think people want to hear it now yeah that's good <laughs> I think your auntie said, uh, Miss uh, Susan, I can't pronounce her last Massey name. Gale. Massey Gale. Uh, this is awesome and amazing, niece. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt Susan. <laughs> it's a family affair. <laughs> Can we give it up one more time for Miss Anjali? Uh, so really briefly, um, I had the pleasure of meeting her and she was telling me about this amazing book and all the things she wanted to do around genealogy. And it got me excited. Uh, for those that don't know, I go by the name of Mr. Image, Mr. IMAG, uh, the STEAM MC. So I'm a hip hop artist, I'm an educator, and I'm an engineer as well. And a lot of my music is used to teach different topics. So um, I founded an organization called the Swaliga Foundation uh, right here in Washington, DC. And we use the arts to teach STEM, science, tech, engineering, arts, and math. We call it STEAM. We're the leaders in STEAM education. So I thought this was a great opportunity to dive in and learn more about genealogy, about DNA. And there were so many questions that I had um, that I was asking her that we kind of researched and found out together just about how our DNA 
actually is transferred. You know, like the scientific way, like we know we're made of atoms. We all know we have DNA. We've heard the word genes. We've heard chromosomes. But how does that actually come together to make up our physical being? And how do we transfer that? And how are we connected to our family, both here that we know and our family overseas? And this song that you're about to hear in a couple of seconds basically explains that through music, like going from an atom to molecules to genes to chromosomes, the whole thing, um, in a cool way, I like to think. And hopefully, it inspires some more conversation. So I'm going to play it. And again, the song is not finished, so. <laughs> <laughs> My dummy project, so I leave it, baby. And I'm a G. Okay. It's in my blood and my DNA. They want to walk when I flex like weight. It's in my blood and my DNA. They want to shine when I fly like me. Yeah. Yeah. It's in my DNA. It's in my DNA. It's in my DNA. So prevailing, so prevailing. Every time we connect, it was thousand makes it. This is my DNA. I was born with it. It packed in tight like jeans on fitted. Stick to the G code, no the wrong city. Gotta stay focused. My chromosomes are real. This is my DNA. Yeah, 
So this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. It's it's not necessarily over. Um, we do. Anyone else have any comments, questions? Anyone? Anyone have anything to say? Oh yes, we do have a question in the back. Please. Okay. So I oftentimes when you write a book, it feels like you are finished with the project, right? And this is really just the beginning. So. Um, how can we, what, what are you doing with this now that it's out in the world, and how can we help you spread that message? So, the question was, what do we do now that the book is finished, now that it's out in the world, and how do we help to spread the message? If I could put this book in the hands of every black kid in this city, in this country, I would do it. In all of the all of the African diaspora. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, if you if you're able to buy copies and give them to schools or to you know younger members of your own family or even older members of your family for that matter, that would be fantastic. Um, the work is like you said, it's just the beginning. Um, we want to to build on what we've started, um, not just with the book but also with the nonprofit. So so that's what's that's what's next is just is building up the nonprofit. That will, I do want to ask you more questions about your nonprofit. I had a follow-up suggestion, though. It would be, I think it would be great for this book to be translated into Spanish, Portuguese, French, and, and other languages, especially in indigenous African languages as well, because I think that, would, that could be a project for people, anyone listening, see if you can get the book and translate it, uh, because as uh, we've seen that the diaspora is all over, and so... Um, especially with Portuguese speakers, a lot of times they don't necessarily speak English. I found that out. So definitely we need to do that. Um, and then I did want to ask you more about your nonprofit organization. Can you uh, let us know more about your nonprofit? How can we get involved? And what are you doing to grow it? Yes, all of the above. Yeah, so the nonprofit launched last year, last February. Actually, yeah, last, last year, Black History Month. Um, <laughs> so the goal for the nonprofit is to be an on a free online genealogy club. Anybody can join. It's not going to cost you anything. There's no membership fees. Um, the goal for the club, what I want to do is actually create content and have like monthly webinars where we talk about genealogy tips, where we help people do genealogy research, but not just that, where we also have um, like people come in and talk about African history and have people come in and talk about, you know, mental health and wellness and collective trauma, just all those things that go into genealogy, not just, you know, you know, start with researching your family, you know, your oral history or whatever, but we want to do like a whole collective wraparound service kind of thing where we talk about all the issues that are inherent in doing black genealogy. So that that's the goal for the nonprofit. So what I'm doing right now is working with um, different people to try and um, and get those those webinars on, on board and just get the content created. So I'll be doing some of them, but I don't want to be the only voice up there. So I'm, I'm working with different people. Um, shout out to uh, Linda Royster. Um, she's one of the mental health counselors that I'm talking with in terms of creating content for for the website too. So so yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be great. So the goal, of course, is to launch it you know as soon as possible. But you know how it is when you're doing everything, you you know you gotta pace yourself. <laughs> So I just wanted to repeat the name of the nonprofit. It's called the Majani Project, www.majani.org. And if Christine, if you could write that in the on the YouTube so that people can access that. Um, I, what is Majani? Yeah, it might have helped if I'd said that, huh? <laughs> so Majani is a Swahili word that means leaves. And the, the idea is that our children are the leaves on their branch of the family tree. That's, be that's beautiful. I like that. And Marcus Garvey said that someone, a person without the knowledge of their history is like a tree without the roots. So you almost, you expanded on that idea and, and went into the concept of leaves. Wow, that's deep. That's very deep. So I'm, if, oh, we have a question online? We have uh, another auntie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, aunt, auntie Carla said, hi, I'm Lee, just wanted to say this is very, a very interesting topic, and I'm very proud of your work. God bless you. Love, Auntie Carla. 
it is so great to have family, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not even being funny. Like, I, I so appreciate that because like I told you guys early on, I didn't grow up around my family, my extended family. So I don't really know them that well. So for them to show up for me like this, it means everything. So thank you, Aunt Carla. Yes, the aunties are in the house today. <laughs> the virtual house. Yeah, they were here though. They didn't just have to be here in spirit. They were here in the, in the metaverse. Okay, so I just what I'll do before we close the event, and we're going to allow Angelique, uh, Angelique the opportunity to sign copies of the book. I want to just read uh, with the blurb on the back of the book, and we'll close with that. <clears throat> A first ever genealogy primer written unapologetically for Black youth. This handbook covers the basics as well as introduces topics like reparative genealogy and restorative justice for the culture also includes useful information about the African diaspora in Canada, the Caribbean and Central and South America, as well as free resources available to the researcher. Straight from the heart and full of love for the culture. This handbook is a safe space for the young black genealogist to begin a journey to one identify and honor the ancestors, and two, reclaim our collective legacy of family. Black history is family history. So happy Black History Month, Black History 365, 366, during the leap year. And we're gonna keep rolling. Thank Angelique, join me in, in thanking Angelique for gracing us with our presence today. Anyone interested in purchasing the book who's in store, you can buy it at the, the back counter there. And anyone online can visit sankofa.com and they can purchase the book online. And we'll, we can ship it to you. The aunties, wherever you are, we can ship it to you. <laughs> and also you can uh, pick it up in the store if you want. Yes, Christina. Uh, you got a comment from your big brother. Uh, Callie, uh, shout out from your big bro, uh, Callie. Very proud of you. Uh, Andre Thurman, oh, Audrey Thurman, uh, gave a bunch of thanks live emojis. And Christina Massingale said, so awesome, cousin. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. That's family and church family. So thank you. Thank you, Audrey. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, everyone. So... Clap it up for yourselves. You could have been anywhere in the world that you chose to be here tonight with us. Um, this is a very pleasant crowd. Appreciate you guys' energy. And you don't have to leave. Uh, the cafe is still serving food. Um, you can definitely buy books, you know, still. Um, and yeah, we're going to put some music on and have a good time. All right, take care.